gather around all you bros and non-bros. It's time to answer the age-old question of why the Super Mario Bros. movie failed to live up to the hype and legend that is the game. Are you still skeptical about why that movie sucked? Well, find out why right here on the Game Cinema. Greetings interweb, welcome back to another episode of Game vs Movie, the show that upsets alien fanboys worldwide. But seriously, our last show on Alien Isolation caused a stir in certain die-hard alien fanbase community. I'm not going to name any names, but let's just say boy were they mad at me. You see, this show is based on pure facts. Remember we are simply comparing the video game script that of the movie or vice versa to figure out if there is any originality or poor portrayal of the storylines in both movie and game when compared to their original scripts. Today we are taking a look at Super Mario Bros, Nintendo's biggest and most prized mascot. Published as a pseudo sequel by Nintendo in 1983, it was originally released in Japan for the family computer on September 13, 1985 and later that year for the Nintendo Entertainment System in North America, Europe and Australia on the 15th of May 1985. It was the first of the Super Mario series of games. The game featured Plumbing Brothers, Mario and Luigi as they traveled through the Mushroom Kingdom, bashing and stomping on baddies with an end goal of rescuing Princess Peach. The game's mid-80s release popularized the side-scrolling sequence of the already popular platform video game of the 80s. In addition to its definitive features, the game has sold enormously well and was the biggest selling game of all time for a single platform for approximately 3 decades at over 40 million units. Needless to say, Super Mario Bros. series was and still is a big deal. With all its success at the time, there was no doubt Nintendo was onto something big and it wasn't too long before Hollywood came knocking at Nintendo's doorsteps. So why a movie, you ask? The question in question is a question we have to look at deeper to find an answer. Hmm, I think I might have said the word question one too many times. Anyway, lame joke. All jokes aside, wait, 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 wait. You haven't seen the movie. Wait, what? You haven't seen the Super Mario Bros. movie? Okay, pause the video here, go watch the atrocity and come back. I'll, I'll wait right here. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Any questions before we move on? Okay, good. By the 90s, Super Mario Bros. was the biggest intellectual property on the planet. Super Mario Land had just been released in Japan, and Nintendo's pixelated plumber was slapped on everything from cereal boxes to t-shirts to comic books. Mario's name alone was worth millions. Nintendo was cautious with his property. The publisher knew that Super Mario Bros. did not have a deep narrative. How would a studio translate the simple formula into a 90 minute film. Skeptical? Well, producer Roland Joffe of Light Motive thought he could figure it out. Joffe's production company was inexperienced, but had directed the Oscar nominated films The Killing Fields and The Mission, which gave the studio some credibility. Despite numerous offers from bigger and more experienced companies, who by the way offered way, way more money for the rights for the film. Nintendo was intrigued by Joffe's ideas. What was more interesting is that the fact that Joffe had agreed to let Nintendo retain the merchandising rights to the film. A very strategic move, enabling him to walk away with a $2 million deal. Hollywood was in uproar. No one could quite believe that a small time filmmaker had bagged the most sought after brand name of the decade. In a rare moment for the character, Mario's future was now partially out of Nintendo's control. After securing the rights to the film, Light Motive immediately set to work trying to cite high-level talent. The studio approached Danny DeVito to both direct the film and play Mario. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Michael Keaton was approached for the role of King Cooper, but all three passed on the project. Even Tom Hanks was approached to play Mario, but the executives thought that Hanks was asking for too much money, so they fired Hanks in favor for Bob Hoskins. Hoskins was hot off the successes of films like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and The Hook. 
so the producers felt that he would be a more bankable star. While Leitmotiv continued its search for actors and directors, it commissioned the first of many scripts, Barry Morrow, one of the Academy Award winning writers of Rain Man, who took first crack at the plot, but his treatment was deemed too dramatic and the project was passed over to a writing team that had worked on The Flintstones and Richie Rich. This version of the script was more in line with Mario's roots. Mario and Luigi traveled to a magical land where the evil King Cooper, an actual green lizard king, had kidnapped a princess named Hildy and made her his bride, so he could access the magical crown of invincibility. The Mario brothers and their psychic toad set off on a quest to rescue the princess and prevent Cooper from getting his hands on the artifact. Done. There you have a script directly in line with the game. This script was likely the closest thing the film would get to ever mirroring the playful world imagined in Nintendo's games. However, Lightmotive had already signed a directorial team to the project, Rocky Martin and Annabelle Janko, and thus opening a world of uncertainties for the future of the film. Martin and Janko's vision for the film was much darker than Nintendo's game series. The film to take place in an alternate reality version of New York, a place called Dinohan, after an asteroid had struck Earth 65 million years ago, banishing all planet's dinosaurs to a dystopian version of our world, basically an alternate universe. But the two realities are still connected by a portal under New York. As eons passed, the dinosaurs grew to hate the humanoids that blissfully walked on the Earth's surface. Nintendo's hand was off the project at this point. According to one of the directors, Nintendo let us do what we wanted. We put a crushing deadline on the project. The movie had to be made by a certain date, otherwise there would be all these financial penalties, which added lots of stress on the project. The directors and producers struggled to agree on a script to match the movie's new direction. More rewrites were issued, some scripts contained inspirations from Die Hard, another script featured a Mad Max style death race. The Super Mario Bros. film was pulling inspirations from everywhere and everything, which spiraled the production of the entire project out of control. And this didn't do the film or Nintendo's reputation any good. You would think with an asset as valuable as the Mario franchise, you would do everything in your power to see that it turns out great, or at least good, but they were in a hurry to get things done, making poor decisions on the overall production of the movie. By mid-1992, Production was well on the way, holding the director's inspiration for a darker film. At the same period, there was a hardcore movement against video games, and a lot of anti-video game sentiments, so to appeal to the better side of the public, the director steered the film towards an older demographic, and not the younger population that the Super Mario Bros. franchise captured the hearts of in the first place. Director Morton, won on record by saying, I wanted to make a film that was sophisticated. Wait, what? Super Mario Bros. isn't sophisticated. It's a game that's designed to capture the like-minded, imagination of gamers and adolescents that, according to scientists, get a buzz from playing video games. So when you throw sophistication in the midst of something that's innocent and simple at its core, you're bound to end up with something that looks like Jekyll and Hyde on steroids. He carried on saying that, I wanted parents to get really into it. I wanted to make a film that would appeal to parents to get them to be interested in video games. No, you, you don't do that. You can't make a film to appeal to a demographic that's not your target audience. It's just not going to work. Of course, not everyone shared Martin and Janko's vision for the film. The studio was expecting a light-hearted kids film, and most of the cast and crew signed on with the same expectations. The tension between these two visions put an even bigger strain on the film as the studio felt that the film was too dark, pressuring Malton and Janko to lighten things up. So Lightmotive brought in the writer from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures to write yet another version of the script, but Malton refuses to work with him, stating that he already had the set built and some characters with prosthetics had already been made. So that script came in, but a lot of it didn't match what they already started working on. By this point, at least nine writers had worked on a project and the rewrites will continue long after the cameras started rolling. The script ballooned into a mushroom of confusion, as the production crew was handed new daily edits. Dennis Harper claimed that the script had probably been rewritten six or seven times by the time he arrived. 
Aside from script issues and an inexperienced production team, there were tension on set. Head of production Joffe recalled finding directors and cast locked in script meetings in the middle of shooting over a scene that was 11 minutes long. I had to jolly everyone back on set, he stated. It was like being a schoolmaster. Martin and Janka would often find themselves in the producer's trailer on a nightly basis, being told they were going to be fired as they're doing a poor job, they're spending too much money, and the whole thing was a disaster. Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo, on the other hand, admitted to booze and set, taking shots of scotch between scenes to get through the disaster that was the Super Mario Bros. making. Hoskins was particularly aggrieved by the husband and wife duo, later revealing in an exclusive interview with The Guardian, quoting, It was the worst thing I ever did, Super Mario Bros. It was a fucking nightmare. The whole experience was a nightmare. It had a husband and wife team directing, whose arrogance had been mistaken for talent. After so many weeks, their own agent told them to get off the set. Fucking nightmare. Fucking idiots. Unquote. By many accounts, Rocky Martin and Annabel Janko was out of their depths. The husband and wife team didn't have many movie credits under their name. In fact, they had only directed one little film, a critical and commercial bomb called DOA. The couple paved their way by creating commercials for Coca-Cola and Hardy's restaurants, eventually finding small success after creating the television series Max Headroom. Lightmotiv loved the Max Headroom's zany vibe and felt that the couple had the right imagination for a film like Super Mario Bros. How wrong were they, right? Despite Martin and Janko's vision for a movie that sounded nothing like Nintendo's series, the duo attentively worked in a few video game references. Yoshi appeared as King Cooper's pet and briefly previewed the Super NES Super Scopes functioned as a portable de-evolution gun during the film's climax. However, one key reference almost didn't make the cut. Martin and Janka didn't want the Mario Bros to appear in their classical red-green overalls. They fought the producers for weeks but finally gave in, allowing Mario and Luigi to don their plumber's outfit around three-fourths of the way in the film. There was so much wrong with the overall project that it's unrecognizable. In fact, the only resemblance the film had to the game is Mario and Luigi's outfits, Yoshi and the fact that they had to rescue a princess. If you played the game, the movie makes no sense. There were too many flaws in the script that had to be plugged and worked on during shooting, which led to a lot of rework and ad-libbing just to make sense of everything. And that all came with a price. Over budget, behind schedule, and managing a class that was either drunk, working on script, or completely belligerent. Super Mario Bros. had run completely off the rails. The entire project was a train wreck. When the film had its red carpet premiere, it was apparent to everyone that it captured none of the magic of the games. Released on May 28, 1993, the film cost $48 million to make and grossed less than $21 million. From everyone's point of view, the film was a mess. It got rushed into production with a script that has been rewritten two weeks prior to the film and actors signing up unprepared to improvise dialogue. Miyamoto has yet to comment candidly on Hollywood's bastardization of his most iconic creation. A lot of excuses can be made for Super Mario Bros. movie. It was made during a different era. No one had tried to make a big budget video game movie before. Our Nintendo didn't know how much input they should have on production. One can also argue that special effects technology limited directors' abilities to portray the fantastic elements often found in games. However, it's hard to escape the fact that Super Mario Bros. was a bad film, a byproduct of bad choices and unfortunate mishaps. The Super Mario Bros. movie should stand as a testament for how not to make a video game movie. But hey, this is not a game review, nor is it a movie review, it's just game versus movie. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey, it's me, Yada Mario. Please don't forget to like the video, it really helps us out. And be sure to subscribe for upcoming episodes.